Well, greetings once again from Gentleman Jim, the brother from Harlow. You know that guy with that high school education? Well, let me tell you about some different people that used to come into Ori. Like I say, I, I've spoken on the regular hangouts. I've spoken about entertainers and athletes and all kinds of musicians and civil rights people. I've talked a lot a little about that. Now, Ori had a couple of friends that I had met uh, for the first time. A guy named Ernest and a guy named Joe. Now, Ernest and Joe were gay guys. Now, I grew up around homosexuals because we had some lived in our neighborhood. And we didn't pay much attention to them. They went about their business as people go about their business. So, but I never really got close to any of them. So I didn't know how to react when I met Joe and Ernest. But, hey, they were, they were Ori's friends. If you're a friend of Ori's, you're a friend of mine. So at any rate, back in those days, you know, gay guys were looked at as, well, they called them queers, they called them, they called them names, and they still do. They, you know, people are very hard on people. Look, what you do with your life, that's your business. Now back then, Ori brought Joe and Ernest in to kind of be greeters for us. Ori had grown so big, so big, so big, so big, that we had a big time tailor shop manufacturing established. Or, I told you, Ori was making suits. We had now oh, well over 20 people working for us, making suits. We had created the downstairs, with a huge building, with a huge finished basement that Ori converted into a factory. So he spent a lot of time downstairs cutting suits, making sure everything got right, making sure this was done, that was done. He was handling that part. Now he left the responsibility of the tailor shop on me. That was his right arm back then. So he left all of that on me to handle. Now, Ernest and Joe greeted people. We had so many people come. Oh, people, everybody was coming in and out of Ori's Custom Tailoring back there. So they were great greeters and they, they served us well. So we're going along and then one day Ernest tells Ori, he said, Ori, my minister is opening up a church right next door, it was a vacant uh, building, a vacant unit right next door to us. He said, my minister's gonna open up and put his church over there. Well, Harlem, like a lot of places, is full of what we call storefront churches. We did a lot of work for Reverend Ike back in the day, and he had a storefront church in a, in a vacant movie theater on 125th Street for many years before he moved it uptown. So there was nothing new about a storefront churches. They had more storefront churches in Harlem than you could imagine. It seemed like every block had a storefront church. They weren't very big, they didn't have big congregations, but they were there. You heard the music, you heard the tambourines, the drums and horns, all in these little small churches. Now most of them weren't that big. And, and I would assume they didn't have any more than 50, 60 members at any given time. Boy, but block by block by block, there's storefront churches. Now, they had all kind of denominations on them. You could see their little sign on the door, and you could always see people coming and going all the time in each one of these little churches. Well, now all of a sudden, we're gonna get a church right next door to us. So I started wondering and asking myself, and I didn't ask Ernest, too many questions about his, his minister, but it dawned on me. Back then, the gay community wasn't really accepted in your average church because gay people were looked upon as unholy, going against God. All the things then that they said about the gay community is still today 
what they're saying about the gay community. But who are we to judge a person's lifestyle? Because that's what it is. It's a lifestyle. It's a belief. You know, you have people saying, well, they felt this way all their life. They're converting. Now you got transgender. See, before back then, most of your gay community, like what I talked about in the Jewel Box Review, these were just people in drag. Nowadays, it's a total lifestyle. We, in today's world, we've got politicians, artists, entertainers, poets, authors that are, that are gay. Now, they're accepted, but see, they're accepted because of the talent that they have. Now, you ask the average person, they really don't have too much to do with a gay person, but if they're talented or a celebrity or something, they're all over on there. Well, back then, they were still looked upon. They were called dirty names by a lot of people. That made me feel uncomfortable to, to hear the, the, the way, the vulgarness of the way some of these people talked about them. Boy, it hurt me. That's me. But we're expecting now Reverend O'Neill, that's what Ernest's pastor of his name, Reverend O'Neill to put his church right next door. When I say right next door, I can knock on the wall and he could hear me knocking That because he was right next door. So at any rate, we get a chance to meet Reverend O'Neill when he's finally ready to open the church up. And nice gentleman. Just a gay, what we used to call a gay preacher. Well, like I said, it dawned on me because in all the churches I had been into, I never saw homosexual people in the church because there were a lot of churches wouldn't even let them in. So you really had to be in the closet to get in there. And Ernest and Joe weren't that, what we call, flaming gay. They were just two guys. They looked like two regular guys. The flaming ones we used to call sissies back in the day because some of them dressed like women or wore women's, some part of women's accessories. These guys didn't. Now, as the church was developing, we did see them type coming in and out because, like I say, they were right next door to us. And the development of that church was literally amazing how they developed that church to get to the size and the amount of followers that they eventually end up having. Now, I say that because, like I'm saying, Maybe there was some other gay churches in New York in those days. I don't know. But I know this one, and I watched it grow to become a mega church over the course of some years till finally they outgrew the building that they were in, and they moved to Brooklyn and got a big gay church. So it was very unique to see how all of this went down and how the development of Reverend O'Neill grew as far as the leader of the gay community. Now, was he the leader in all of New York? I don't know that either. But I can tell you this, the way he grew that church, the amount of people coming and going, sharing God in the way that they like to share it. Now, I know they had a good time because we could hear the music. We stayed open late. They had late services and during the week sessions, we could always hear the music going there. And a couple of times I went into work on Sundays and it was packed in there. So I know the church was growing. So I'm going to leave you guys on that because when I come back to you again, I'm going to tell you the development of that church and just how amazing it was and the relationship that we developed with Reverend O'Neill. So, Gentleman Jim here, brother from Harlem, in Harlem, talking about Harlem with the high school education. I'll be back. So, you guys just watch out for this next session. Be with you soon.